In the middle of the night, August the 16th, I got a call from the sister of Laura, an Australian actress in LA that had gone missing after meeting up with a man she'd recently met on a dating app. Today, I'll be talking to Laura about that night and how it turned her world upside down. From Storic Media, you're listening to Codename Siren, a true crime podcast with Nina Hobson. Obviously, you're not aware of that conversation at the time, but I can only imagine now what that's been like for you, knowing that your family were going through hell thinking that you had gone missing. But I'm going to let you tell your side of the story and then we'll look at more parts of it as we go. Yeah, sure. I met a guy on Hinge. It was after a long day of work. I was very tired. I tried to take a nap and I thought, yeah, I'm just going to stay in tonight and have an early night because I've got work again tomorrow morning. But I'd been chatting to this guy and we'd been having some great conversations and I thought, this sounds like a a cool guy, enjoyed where our conversations were going, I liked his point of view, I liked the way he talked. So I was like, yeah, this could be cool. And he was like, do you want to meet for happy hour? And I was like, well, I was going to have an early night. And he's like, that's fine, that's fine, we don't have to do it tonight. And I was like, no, you know what, let's just do it. You'd never met him physically? No, had not. Was it text using the dating app facility or was it by this point your phone? Initially it was all the dating app. Right. And then as of that morning, we'd switched over to texting via our phones. Got home from work. I had a nap. I took a shower. I got myself ready. I called an Uber and it took me to a bar in downtown Santa Monica on the promenade. And it was kind of crazy, rowdy margarita bar. He was kind of jittery and nervous, I'm assuming. I wasn't really sure. He didn't seem like the guy that I'd been talking to. But maybe that was nerves. I wasn't really sure. But he also didn't really look like his photos all that much. He was dressed very loudly. He was quite tall. I'm thinking like 6'2", 6'3". He had this like really bright shirt on, like blue with these like melting yellow faces and this big gold chain with like a Hamsa hand on it. And I mean, I like creative people and pretty eccentric artistic people. So I was like, okay, this is interesting, but not not entirely what I thought he would look like. I feel like his photos on Hinge, the faces were all a little just a smidgen fuzzy. So it made him look more a little bit more attractive than than the person who was sitting in front of me. And look, I've been on a dating site. You know, it's all done on that instant physical attraction Mm because you literally swipe or do whatever you do and it's an instant look. So when you when you saw that on the on there, you found him attractive. Yeah, I found him attractive. Okay. Did you then read his his profile? profile? Absolutely. I always read profiles. What what was in his profile? I can't really remember. However, it did say, he did say slash claim that he was a lead writer, a lead script writer for Sony Productions and a location scout. So a lot of our discussions had been about that. Less about, I don't know, he didn't go into great detail about his writing uh, projects or anything like that. He'd said that he'd just gotten back from overseas travel and that he traveled a lot. And he'd been to Brazil and all types of places. So you've you've seen his picture, you've read his profile. Now, you're an actress. Yeah. He's in the industry. Yeah. Um, so there's a, an, an immediate or a natural kind of connection, I assume. Yeah. And then this impromptu meeting happens. And you get a an Uber to that the place where you're meeting him. Yes. And the reason I ask that is later on, I want to talk about, you know, when suddenly you're missing the things that I needed and the information I needed to try and find you. And that was important. So you, at this point, you've told no one. I had told my friend Lisa and sent her a photo of my outfit before I left for the date. Had you mentioned him at all to the, to anyone at that point? I may have briefly mentioned that I was talking to a guy to her earlier in the day because we would Marco Polo like video 
send video messages to each other throughout the day, pretty much every day. So I may have mentioned it earlier, but I was also very tired that day and didn't lead her to believe that I was going to be going out or anything that night earlier in the day. So she was pretty surprised that I was going anywhere. So you've told her you're going on a date. You showed her how cute you look. But we don't think she knows who this guy is. No. And do, does she know where you're actually going for the no. date? Okay. So mm-hmm. she just knows you're going on a date. Mm-hmm. Okay. You get to the restaurant. You see him or he, whichever way around it was. Yeah. What happens next? He'd found us a table right at, like on the promenade, on the street of the promenade. But he, want, he was looking for a table closer into the restaurant for some reason because there was a band playing, like a mariachi band playing on the promenade, but then the, the bar restaurant also had really loud music playing. So he was like, oh, it feels like a battle of the bands type thing right now. I want to be closer to the, to the bar or whatever. And I was like, well, this is a nice table. We're a bit removed from other people. We can chat here. Let's just stay here. When you say he was jittery. Do you think he was jittery for a reason other than nerves? Was there any th- was there any point you thought maybe he's taken something or was it it was just he's a bit nervous, shy? I was just thinking maybe he was just a bit nervous. But it was weird because well, it seemed strange to me because the way that we had communicated and conversed via text messages and everything, he he came across as a lot more thoughtful. Yeah, just more of a deep thinker. But then when I met him and he was talking, every second word was fuck. And I'm like, he's just not speaking like a writer, like this highly educated person he told me he was. And, I mean, maybe that was just nerves and that's just the way he talks. But it just didn't seem to match up to me. And I've I've seen text messages because I've had some from him. Yes. And I would agree, like, if, and a lot of people say fuck all the time, but I wouldn't have thought that of the way that he writes things. But going back to the writer part, you didn't touch on anything over the whole time you knew him that was specific. Do you think, hand on heart, that he was a writer? I'm wondering if it was more about projecting an image of who he wants to be and wanted to be rather than who he actually was and is today. And I have found that quite a bit with the dating apps as well, that a lot of these guys, and I would say especially men, I mean, I can't really speak to women on these apps. Maybe they're doing the same thing. But a lot of them are saying who they are and projecting an image of who they want to be more than who they really actually are to this day. Obviously, we'll fast forward a little bit. I've checked him out and He's no writer at Sony, but we'll talk about that a bit later. On your profile, are you down as an actress? Yes. Actor, singer, nanny. And you have quite a lot about you on the internet. So Mm -hmm. he wants to move tables. Was there any red flags at that point? Why does he want to move tables? Or was it all genuine that you felt he was, you know, being honest? It was a noise issue. I thought that that was genuine. In the table, you're talking. You're kind of, he's a little bit different. So it was that moment where I've got to sit here for a date, but I really want to be at home and should have stayed at home in my pajamas. Yeah. So then what happens? Waitress comes over and we quickly look at the menu and order a drink. Apparently this bar is like notorious for their extremely heavy pours. So that's what happened. We ordered a drink and it came over and I was like, whoa, this is strong. And then what? I remember because we met at like 7.15, 7.20. I think happy hour was due to end at about 8. So we're drinking this margarita and I remember looking at my drink. The waitress came over again to say, hey, happy hour is going to like end fairly soon. So it must have been it must have been a little while that we were sitting on this drink. But I remember having like at least a third of my drink left. And she's saying, do you want to order another one before happy hour ends? And I'm kind of like, whew, well, I'm not quite ready for it, but okay. And I don't remember the second drink arriving. Do you have any rough idea on what the time was at that point? I got a text message from a potential employer that I was supposed to have a phone call with. It's like 7.30, 7.40. And I'd said to her, oh, I forgot. Can we do it tomorrow or another day? You know that another drink was ordered. You know that you had some, had you had anything to drink before you went out to yes. meet him? When I was at home, I had coffee that was left over from that morning and a whiskey. So you get to a point where you can't remember. What's the next thing that you can remember? 
The next thing I remember is several hours later being in the massive holding cell at Santa Monica Police Station. And it was a big cell. I was the only one in there. I was on the floor, the cold, hard cement floor, just sobbing uncontrollably. And I, and I had been, I think I'd been crying pretty much the entire time for the past several hours. That's how it felt. My voice was hoarse and I started to regain consciousness. And so I went up to the window and I tapped on it and I called for the officers to come over. And one female officer came over and I was shaking and crying and I just was like, what, what's going on? What's going on? What am I doing here? What happened? I said, I, I know, I clearly know I'm intoxicated right now or I was intoxicated, but I genuinely don't know what's happening or why am I here? Did your mind at, at that point when you're in a, in a holding cell in the police station, at that point, did your mind go to anything to do with your date? No, not really at that point. So you talk to the, the officers and th- they say what? She said you were arrested for public intoxication and for assaulting the police officer. I was horrified. Have you ever had any previous incidents no. like this? No. Have you ever been arrested before? No. Have you ever assaulted anyone before? No. You couldn't remember what had happened. You couldn't remember past 7.30. So then what happened? They took me out for processing and I could barely walk, mainly because I was still so emotional and I was kind of still sobbing uncontrollably and I was very shaky. And I said to the two officers that took me in for processing, I'm scared. I don't remember what happened. They were at that point being reasonably kind and getting my fingerprints and that type of thing. And they were like, well, how much did you drink? And I was like, one or two drinks. And the female police officer said, that doesn't sound like something that would happen after one or two drinks that you would black out like that and not remember anything for several hours. That was it really. That was the conversation. And they took my fingerprints, took my photo, and then they led me to a, um, a single cell on my own, which is where I stayed for the next four and a half days. At this time, there's a whole campaign going on internationally because you have your family in Australia, you have connections in New York, you have people in L.A., you have your best friend in the world who came from Portland. Yeah, Portland, Oregon. Um, who flew in. Like mm-hmm. everything was going crazy. I even had people in the U.K. There's posters being made about you. It's Australian actress goes missing on the news. Like it's huge. You have no idea of this no. at all. What are your thoughts about the guy that you've met during this time that you're sat alone in the cell? Honestly, I wasn't thinking about that anymore. Right. I was just thinking about... What am I doing here? How long am I going to be here? What's going to happen to me? I can't let anybody know that I'm here. Not that I didn't want to, just that how can I? How can I let anybody know I'm here? I I don't know how to do that. Like I'm stuck in a cell right now and I'm not able to communicate with anybody right now to let anybody know where I am. And I felt sick about the fact that I couldn't let people know where I was because I knew that they would be worried. And that made me feel doubly sick. And so the police had taken your phone? Yes, they had taken my phone, my wallet, my purse, my keys. However, after I was processed and they said that I could make a phone call, I didn't have anyone to call because I didn't have my phone. They'd said to me, well, don't you know any numbers off the top of your head by memory? And I was like, no, the only numbers that I know are my mum and dad and they're in Australia. And they're like, well, you can't make an international call. And I'm like, well, I don't know any other numbers. And I'm racking my brain trying to think of numbers for anybody. And I couldn't think of a single one. And so I asked them a couple of times, do you have my phone? And they said, no. Okay. So you assumed you'd lost it in the So I assumed I'd lost it. So the entire four and a half days that I'm there or whatever, I assumed that I'd lost my bag with the entire contents of my bag that night because I didn't remember anything. So I was like, okay, maybe I I must have just been drunk in the street and just like 
put my bag down somewhere and then forgot, forgotten where I put it, forgotten to pick it up. I thought maybe I was stumbling around in the street looking for it and that because I didn't have the full story of what had allegedly happened yet. So I was coming up with all these stories in my mind about where my bag would be, what had happened. Maybe I was stumbling around drunk in the street trying to ask people for help. You know, have you seen my bag or anything like that? So I just assumed that I'd lost it. Your friends were incredible. And I've said to you before, you know, you really have a great set of friends who went above and beyond. And because we, at time zones, we were communicating throughout the night. I I think I went three days without sleeping because I wanted to be there for your family. On that first night or, you know, morning or whatever, I did get three calls. And the first call that I made was to the employer that I was supposed to work for that day. Although I didn't know the number off the top of my head, the police were able to Google the business because it was public and get the number. So I just left a a message for them saying that I was in urgent care and that I wouldn't be in work today. And then I got another call and so I tried a bails bondsman because I thought, well, that's all I can do right now. I'll get get them to bail me out. I can go home and then I can sort this out from there. But that bail bondsman wouldn't do anything for me because I didn't have any identification on me. I didn't have my wallet. I didn't have any bank cards. I didn't have any of my credit cards. And so he he just wouldn't do anything because I didn't have any of that information on me. So then I called a third one. He was willing to help me. I didn't have any phone numbers, but I remembered my friend Lisa's email address. So he's like, okay, so at best I'll email her and then we can go about it that way. And so that's what I was banking on the entire time, that she would receive the email, but she never received an email. So the only person who knows that you've been arrested at any time is the guy you went on a date with. Correct. He was with you at the time that you were arrested. Yep. And he was also privy to a lot of activity of people trying to find you in LA. With respect to him, he knew your phone number and that was it. Probably he knew that you had a family. Maybe he knew a little bit about where you may live or, but it, you know, it's a first date, but there is definitely, there was a flyer with a number saying, please contact if you see Laura, she's missing her family worried. It was on every piece of news. It was on TMZ. Every single person that I know in the industry, they all knew your story. Obviously I've asked to speak to him. We're also aware that he videoed things that were happening at the time, so he alleges. We have asked him to give us those videos, of which he's refusing at this stage. Your family report you missing, officially. The police, obviously, they say you're an adult. They did say they would take a missing from home report, but they did also say they wouldn't do anything. They didn't tell anyone, even taking a missing from home report, that you were in jail four days of your family not needing to worry because you were safe. It might not be ideal, but it you were safe. We find out that you're in jail and that you've been there the whole weekend. And Lisa has come over from Portland. We find which court you're at. The prosecutor came over, spoke to us and said, are you here to represent Laura? Yes, we are. Is this like her? Um, obviously, no, 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 it's not like a whatever. And he said, yeah, it seems so out of character. Something's gone wrong. Like something happened on that night. We don't know what. Because at that point, you have been charged with assault in a police officer. Correct. If that was in the UK or Australia, that's mandatory prison time. Eventually, I just have to kind of like surrender and give up. Well, not give up, but just surrender to the fact that I have no idea what's going to happen and I have no control over the situation. I'm worried sick because I can't let my employer know that I'm not coming to work on Monday or Tuesday. But I knew they'd be worried too. And evidently they were because my employer rocked up at my door at my house Monday morning when I didn't turn up for work. Tuesday morning, I'm finally feeling like a, a, a just a small sense of relief because finally I'm actually going to court, which means that I might actually get let out today. Just get whisked off to court in a big van with a bunch of other kind of career criminals. And then we're at the courthouse and it's like, what, 8.30, 9 a.m. or something? Yep. 
I'm in a holding cell with a bunch of other women who are already in county jail, but they're in there, I guess, like trying to lessen their sentences and that type of thing. Then I went up to eventually, I don't even know what time it was or anything like that, hours go by and um, eventually I get taken upstairs and um, I meet with the public defender and she says to me, your family are here. And I'm just in complete disbelief. Like, what do you mean my family are here? How did they find me? And I'm thinking my family have flown over from Australia. I was just like, what do you mean they're here? Who's here? How did they find me? And she tells me it's Lisa and Alessandra. And I'm just like in, in disbelief, but I'm also really relieved. And, and then we sit down again, still highly emotional. And, um, she te- and I said to her, you know, I don't know what happened to my things that night. I lost my bag, my phone, my wallet, so I couldn't call anybody. And she looks at her computer screen and she says, no, they've got all of that. It's all here your phone, your wallet, your house keys, your purse, and I just lost it. I was just a puddle. Right. (laughs) So overwhelmed with emotion and I don't know if I was angry. I I just felt grief, so much grief and injustice and why didn't they tell me they had my things? I couldn't call anybody because they said they didn't have my phone. So a lot of people were affected by... The actions on the Friday, a lot of people were affected around the world. Something that could have been easily rectified. Easily. So you're now in court. So my conditions of release were to attend two AA meetings a week, get an attendance verification or validation slash a court record for every single meeting that I attended, to provide eight character references write up an entire employment history from my time in the US, so from 2016 to now, and then write a letter outlining who I am, why I'm in the US, what I'm doing here, why I want to stay here, and why I should be granted diversion. Can you just explain what diversion is? From my understanding, diversion is basically no jail time. So instead of that, I would most likely have to continue going to AA meetings, potentially rehab if they deemed it necessary, and possible um, community service. So that's what happens. You get released. I leave the courthouse and then I walk towards my friend Lisa, but TMZ intercept me first. I forgot about that. (laughs) Yeah. Shoving a camera in my face. Hey, Laura, 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 what do you have to say to all the people who have been worried about you and looking for you? And I just look at Lisa. I'm like, Lisa, what's going on? Because at that point, you know nothing. I knew nothing. And so we hugged. And then she said to me, Oh, we've got a lot to talk about. Right. At this point, I'm still dealing with your family and we need to track down the guy that you met because I remember the conversation was, I can't remember anything after 7.30. I don't know whether I was drugged. And obviously that was a big, huge issue because we know that that happens, you know, not all the time, but it's something that goes on. So we had to try and locate him and establish really whether there was any chance that you had been drugged Mm -hmm. and that this wasn't an alcohol issue, that there was something more to it. And at that point, you were remembering the fact, you know, that there was this moving away to a different table and then you couldn't remember what had happened and then calling, you called the Uber, but you didn't get in the Uber. So, of course, when we're doing the investigation side, that was a huge issue because it's like, shit, why didn't she get in an Uber? But so anyway, we start having that conversation and, and that's when you told me that your first text message when you come out of jail is from him. So on Wednesday when I got my phone back, I was relieved to see that he had texted me. And he'd actually texted me at, what it was something like 10 or 11 o'clock that night, the night that I'd met him. So he'd said, I'm sorry you got arrested. I tried to save you, but the whole not giving your last name didn't really help. I then came to the police station and tried to bail you out but they said I couldn't and that you needed to sleep it off. I got another text message from him about noon the following day saying, are you okay? I have video evidence of the arrest. If you need it, 
And if you need any help, let me know. So at that point, when you read that and you had a conversation with me, we were thinking, you know what, this is probably okay. It's not, that's not the actions of somebody who's attempted to drug me for whatever reason. And then there's being nice, although sometimes that's a smart thing to do. But then it kind of got a little bit more tricky with him. And there was a sense of you were getting the attention because you were getting a lot negative attention and the media were feeding on the fact that you're an Australian actress and that was the headlines. And I remember that my friend in Australia called me and said, your case, I'm up in the night talking to her, your case is on Good Morning Australia or whatever, the the biggest morning show ever. So we go back to our guy and and he then starts being unpleasant. He started to be weird. So what, I got my phone back on Wednesday. I spoke to you. You advised me not to text him back just yet because you were trying to verify who he was, confirm his identity, and also that he worked at Sony as a lead write, lead script writer yeah. and a location scout. We couldn't verify that, evidently. Um, I couldn't find any information about him online either. In the meantime, I went back on Hinge because it was still on my phone. He'd unmatched with me, so I couldn't find him. It was a few days after I was released and I finally texted him back and thanked him for trying to help me. He acted butthurt that I hadn't reached out to him sooner to thank him. I sort of had to mitigate that and say to him, well, I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Like I was in jail. Which you knew Which and no one else did. you Just knew. Side note. I don't know. Like what? I was in jail and I didn't have my phone. I just got it back. And then after that was advised not to communicate with anyone yet. And at the time I was obviously communicating with and him. So and so you had started communicating with him first yes. before I even texted him Yes, back. and had told him that any communication would come via me. Because, again, at that point we didn't know whether – there had been something more sinister. Yeah, exactly. There have been many developments with the case since I had this conversation with Laura. She's now living back in Australia and dealing with the fallout of the situation. Unfortunately, all factors of the case were not investigated fully, leaving the impression of an intoxicated woman that attacked a police officer. And we know there's way more to the story than that. Join me next week as we follow up with Laura from Australia about further developments in the case and the impact it's had on her life. Until next time, I'm Nina Hobson, and this has been Codename Siren. Siren.